Everybody, I think uh, we'll, we'll get underway. Um, I'm pleased to see, uh, I'm not surprised to see a very full room because this is a very interesting day for Japan in Davos and a very interesting year for Japan. Uh, Prime Minister Abe made his uh, speech this morning, his first speech in Davos for five years. And he set out an agenda, an ambitious agenda for Japan's chairmanship of the G20, mm. which will be very important at a moment of big uncertainty in the global economy. Japan has a big responsibility to try to guide things over the coming year. And of course, uh, important challenges at home, which the Prime Minister talked about and which we'll talk about further during the course of this coming hour. So let me introduce the panel, starting with myself. Uh, I'm Gideon Rachman. I'm a journalist at the Financial Times, a columnist on foreign affairs. To my left is the minister, Hiroshogi Seko, uh, who's the minister for trade and the economy, who informs me he got in here at 1 a.m. from Moscow, but uh, <laughs> is, is doing, looking alert nonetheless. Um, to his left is Tak Ninami, the uh, chief executive uh, of Suntory Holdings and also a member, senior member of the Prime Minister's Advisory Council on the Economy. To his left is Kaiko Tashiro, Senior Executive Managing Director, Head of Overseas Operations at Daiwa Securities. And on the far left is my compatriot, uh, Adair Turner, who is a distinguished economist, writer, uh, Chairman of the Energy Transitions Commission, and with strong views on Japan and on Abenomics, which we'll hear later. Uh, but Minister, if I could start with you. Um, the, the Prime Minister, when he spoke this morning, said, that he was very proud that he had defeated defeatism about Japan, essentially that Abenomics had worked. Give us a recap in your own view. What, what do you think you've achieved uh, as a government in the six years, more than six years now, since he took power? Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, trade and industry of Japan. I will provide you some of my personal information. Actually, Ms. Keiko Tashiro and I were classmates oh. at oh. Waseda University. Oh, really? she, she studied much harder than me, so she can make <laughs> her presentation in English. Yes, I can make my presentation in my poor, broken English, but now I am a minister, so I have to use a politically correct words and phrase. And moreover, main purpose of your main, your main purpose to come here is not to listen my English. <laughs> it is to listen in depth and detailed my opinion or comment. So please allow me to use simultaneous uh, translation. Well, first of all, first of all, about the accomplishment of economics, that's a question posed to me. So I would say that uh, uh, administration st stayed more than six year period. Uh, to foreigners, uh, it sounds uh, rather comical, but uh, every year we have had a practice of a new cabinet. That practice has continued for a long time. So uh, having served the premiership for more than five year period is hard to find in Japan after the post war period in history. But uh, despite that, the uh, Abe administration continued for six years. It's not only this uh, long number of duration. Much accomplishment have been achieved uh, didn't fall into the populism in the foreign affairs, uh, securities, and uh, economic policy front as well. What should be done should have been done. That is the accomplishment of Abe administration, particularly economic policy, Abenomics. I would like to say uh, five points. All of the five points that I will be sharing with you is something that uh, both at home and abroad, people thought that Japan will never be able to do it. First is a corporate governance reform. On this point, we admit that Japan has been lagging behind. Still, it's not adequate, but in the terms of the form, when it comes to the independent outside directorship, uh, there are 90% or more of these companies now have more than two independent outside directors. The challenge is going ahead is to increase the quality, but uh, we have at least come this far. Second point is the uh, 
regulatory reform, which is a very difficult issue for Japan, and people said Japan will never be able to do it, but under Abe administration, for the regenerative medicine, for example, uh, new drugs is now being approved and reviewed fastest. Dr. Yamanaka, who is an expert on the regenerative medicine, is my classmate during the junior high school years and high school years. I didn't know that uh, uh, one day Japan will become a uh, regenerative uh, medicine country where other countries would envy. And also, the regulatory sandbox system has been introduced. Maybe Japan is a tenth or more uh, in the country, uh, in the world for having introduced sandbox system, but uh, most of the country had done it for the uh, financial technology, fintech, but uh, in drone and other area, we had uh, introduced the sandbox system as well. And the third is a corporate tax reform. Here again, uh, Japan's uh, corporate tax rate used to be very high, but uh, at the maximum, up to 20% reduction of the corporate tax reform will be done, which is a bold reform. Another one is uh, people used to say that it's never to be done by Japan stressed by Prime Minister Abe. We would continue to be a flag bearer of the free trade. CPTPP and Japan EU EPA uh, will be or will already have gone into force. RCEP and the WTO reform will be the another challenge. Mega FTA and the WTO, all this framework need to be maintained and we would take the lead in the leading the reform. Fifth one. This is another thing that the people said Japan could never achieve, which has to do with acceptance of foreign workers. Already, 1.3 million foreign workers are accepted by Japan. Foreigners say that uh, Japan's uh, population is declining. How can you achieve the economic development without accepting foreigners as workers? At the previous uh, diet session, of course, uh, it's limited to a certain skill uh, and the uh, sector of the uh, trade uh, or the uh, skill, uh, but uh, we had to uh, reform our immigration control law. So many things have been done more than five-year period. I wouldn't be able to be exhaustive in this, but uh, for the past six-year period, it's not mere duration of the other administration, but uh, good work has been achieved at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And before I go to the, the, the rest of the panel, just uh, briefly, I'd like to ask you to look forward because uh, the Prime Minister chairs the G20. He's got a, at least a couple more years, I think, in office at, at home, probably. Um, so what remains to be done? What do you want to do next? Are you talking, can I talk about domestic affairs of Japan as well? Well, for Prime Minister Abe, the last uh, challenge would be the social security reform. Unless this is reformed, Japan's uh, uh, personal uh, consumption will not go up. And the fiscal consolidation has to be also achieved by Japan. This is a challenge. I'm a METI minister, but uh, toward the uh, second half of uh, last year, as a METI, uh, we had also decided to commit to the social security reform. Innovation, private sector ideas will be gathered and collected so that the social security system can become uh, brighter with a uh, reduction of costs. And for each individual, a healthy longevity will be promised. So we hope that uh, METI can contribute in making social security system brighter and more cheerful. So brighter and more cheerful, I'm intact. You're in the private sector, you're, you're um, forging your own business. Do you take a similarly positive view of what Abonomics has done for the Japanese economy, or do you think more should have been done, different things? I think we have to, we should have done much more probably, but uh, I want to give the uh, honor to the uh, minister. Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate the, the Prime Minister Abe and uh, Mr. Minister Seiko <laughs> on the uh, <coughs> successful turning around of the country. Um, because if you think about the six years ago, we got the deflation, and uh, we, I think a deflation is over. Though there's inertia in the uh, consumer's mind, we have to worry about that, but uh, things have changed. Landscape has changed completely. So I want to say, 
congratulations. However, we got to do a lot of things. I want to raise the three points to uh, enhance uh, the uh, government policies together with the uh, private sectors. One, we got to raise productivity furthermore. We need more technology. And uh, we are suffered by the uh, labor shortages. We knew it. And uh, we, our economy is pretty good now. Momentum is pretty good. And uh, our administration uh, did a great job under the uh, situation of growing population and the declining population. Both are so hard to tackle. Only the, the country, Japan, did it. And uh, we could show the uh, kind of uh, great showcase. However, labor shortages. We have to increase the productivity by bringing disruptive technology much more. We need the, the regulation. And the uh, uh, minister mentioned about the sandbox, but we need more for the big into. Second point is uh, we need more uh, laborers from women. We did a lot, but uh, we need more. Well, I, can't, I, I think, uh, and, uh, and the elderly population. We need a technology which should be friendly for elderly population to get back to work. So that is the first point. Second point would be we need the technology to extend healthy longevity. Um, Minister mentioned about uh, health care. I think that is very important. But that is related to the uh, disruptive technology, artificial intelligence, and the data accumulation to make it happen. We have to make it a hurry. So, and uh, uh, third point is, uh, uh, same as the point raised by uh, Minister Seiko. I'm so surprised about uh, the, the bill which passed uh, the, our Congress that is foreign workers. Hmm. And uh, I it, couldn't it, it, believe. It was, it was very controversial, wasn't it? I happened to be in Tokyo at the time. And to me, I mean, I could see it was a big change for Japan. But the numbers weren't that huge. And there was a big political fight. I mean, not everyone's happy with it, are they? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, in local cities, they are so much in need of the uh, laborers. So this is uh, the de facto to uh, legitimize the uh, workers from abroad. And plus, this bill talks about uh, how we Japanese community uh, mm -hmm. accept the welcome of foreign workers because our communities have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, issues to accept the people from abroad. But do they think of them as, as workers who will go home, or are they accepting that they will be immigrants, people who will make their lives in Japan? I would say this is not the immigration policy. There's a huge argument because of depending on the definition. I would say inclusion policy of Japan. And uh, five years you can stay, and you pass uh, an exam, and uh, you have to demonstrate a certain skill set. But you have to have the skill beforehand, before coming to Japan. And then, if uh, you pass an exam, you can extend the, the stay. And uh, we just uh, uh, limit to the certain uh, uh, sectors, uh, hospitality, restaurant, and uh, uh, hotels, agriculture, um, construction, um, uh, nursing home, I mean, uh, nursing care. Well, limited the sectors, but this is a vital first step to welcome foreign workers much more. Um, personal view, this is my personal view. Something somehow, maybe within a few years' time from now, um, with, I mean, those uh, foreign workers will be able to bring spouses and families. But we have to be ready for that. But this uh, bold move is great for us to show to the world we are accepting. Right. And a lot of people in Davos told me, US. Other countries are, are in trouble. Japan never accepts people from abroad. That's not the case. That's why Minister mentioned about that. I think this is a great, great move. OK. Well, Kaika, I mean, another, that was a theme that the Prime Minister hit in his speech this morning. But the other way he talked about dealing with the labor shortage thing, particularly, was womenomics. And he, uh, if I can say, boasted of the expansion in the workforce, uh, with more women coming into work, said more women are participating in the labor force, I think, than in the US. Uh, what do you think? Is, uh, are you as impressed? Um, so I think the direction of where it's going is, is, is 
forward, look, it's, it's very promising. I think mm. there's, a, there's been a lot of um, uh, progress. But I can give you not one number that sort of dampens my hype. And that is, uh, so, so the WEF announces um, the Global Gender Gap Report every year. So the 2018 report, um, if I remember correct, correctly, Japan was 110th mm. out of 149 countries. Mm. This is 2018. So I, I think we've made a, 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 a progress a bit. We were lower than 110. But that's nothing to brag about. And there's so much more we need to do. So that part, we made some progress, but the way we need to go more is much more than the progress and we it, made. And is so it a far. question of changing attitudes in business or changing laws uh, so that uh, you know, women have the right to, say, take breaks from maternity? Or what kind of thing needs to be done to make it work? So I think the one good thing that Abra, well, there's lots of good things about what they did. But the laws and the, the, the policies, they're all in place. You can actually take maternity leave. It's much more generous than a lot of countries in the world. So it's a matter of whether you can take them or not. It's also a matter of, it's not a woman's issue. I think the, one of the problems that we have is that uh, it's being made a woman's issue. It's not. It's a society issue. And uh, the, the men's, man's side of the equation hasn't been addressed that much. And that's another reason why I don't think we've made as much progress as we should have. So, I mean, to, to put it bluntly, I mean, if you're a young woman starting uh, in a Japanese company, one of the uh, sort of big Japanese mm -hmm. companies, do you think you can be confident that you will have as good a chance of succeeding, going to the top of the company, as your male contemporaries? Or is it still basically quite a chauvinist society? So, in a way, it is still chauvinist, but it's improved a lot more than when I <coughs> joined the workforce. So I, I think there's a lot of progress. It's just that the mentality and the cultural aspects need a more it takes much longer. So the, there's lots of place, things that are in place, but in order to be effective, it, it's going to take a longer time. OK. Well, let's, let's uh, turn for an outside view to Adair Turner. And since we're playing the I was at college game, I was actually went to the same Cambridge College as Adair. But, oh. uh, <laughs> but he was a much better student than me. And he, was, <laughs> he was asked to stay on a teach oh. and all sorts of things. But, uh, but none of us were, were good enough students to actually be able to do this in Japanese. So, yep. Um, yep. Ad Adair, um, <clears throat> you've taken, however, you follow the Japanese economy very story very closely. And you've got, I think, I wouldn't say controversial, but, but not totally mainstream <laughs> views of, w of what's yep. going on. Ex would you like to explain? Well, it's pretty obvious I'm not Japanese. And there's many aspects of the Japanese economy that I'm not an expert in. But I think I know why I was invited to be on this panel, which is that in September last year, I had a Project Syndicate article which was uh, reprinted in the Japan Times and it was entitled Japan's Successful Economic Model. And I deliberately wrote that article to balance against the fact that we get a very imbalanced point of view of the Japanese economy. We get these articles that say it's a very slow growth place, it's got rising public debt, the demographics are a disaster, uh, uh, Governor Karuda's being in place for six years and he always says we'll get at 2% inflation in two years time and it's always another two years, so what's going on? And I just wanted to put some balance into debate in three respects. First, what matters to citizens of a society is not the absolute growth rate, but the mm. per capita growth rate. Yes. Since 2007, the per capita growth rate of Japan has been 0.65%. Over that period, the per capita growth rate of the USA has been 0.65%. UK, 0.39%, and France, 0.34%. Japan is among the richest countries of the world is actually one of the countries which is growing GDP per capita, not very fast, you know, much slower than we used to expect, but that's what happened when you're already a rich country, but as fast as, and indeed a bit faster, than the other countries of the G7. Secondly, aging. So Japan has a total fertility rate of about 1.4. And people run the figures and say, oh, the population is going to decline. So the ratio of working age people to retirees, which is now 2.1, that'll be 1.3 by mid-century. What on earth are you going to do? Those figures always assume that one is going to be stupid enough 
to continue to have a retirement age at 65. <laughs> if you plan to move the retirement age to 70, the decline in that ratio is from 2.1 to 1.8. Still may be a challenge, but a more manageable challenge, mm. provided you do all the sort of things to create healthy longevity, mm. engagement in the workforce, which I think Japan, Japan is an absolute leader in the world in thinking about the issues of healthy longevity. And overall, actually, in an environment where across the world a lot of people are worried, and I think rightly worried, that radical automation possibility might give us a problem of where the jobs come from, maybe not a bad thing to have somewhat decline in the working age population. And certainly that decline has given an extraordinary strong incentive for the Japanese economy to be a leader in robotics and automation, which is a good place to be. Finally, the debt. 236% of GDP, <laughs> uh, public deficit at about 4%, and it never goes down. I want to give, give you a radical and unconventional point of view of this. 236% of GDP, but on the IMF figures, the net figure is 152, because quite a lot is owned by the social security system and other indirect organs of the Japanese state. 96 out of the remaining 152 is owned by the Bank of Japan. <laughs> Only 60% is actually owed to the Japanese or international private sector, and that ratio is not going, growing, and it may never grow. There is an equilibrium where if you have a gross debt of 250% of GDP, a net debt of 150% of GDP, and your bank owns 100% of GDP in loans, in bonds, if your nominal GDP grows at 2% per annum, and you run a 4% of GDP uh, primary deficit, I can show you that that is a mathematical equilibrium which could last forever. Now, my good friend, Governor Kuroda, would deny this completely if he was here. <laughs> what he has done is permanent monetization. There is no possibility whatsoever that those Japanese government bonds on the balance sheet of the Bank of Japan are ever going to be resold to the private sector. They're going to be there forever, but relax, it's okay. That's probably how macroeconomics work in an environment of steady deflation or zip close to zero inflation uh, and of a slightly falling uh, population and very slow growth. So overall, look, of course Japan has problems. The fertility rate is lower than it ideally should be. It would be great if it was 1.6 or 1.8, not 1.4. The decline in the population is bigger than would be required, even if you think a little bit of a decline is good. There are all sorts of problems that have to be dealt with. But if I were a lot of countries in the world, I'd swap Japan's problems for my problems, <laughs> because I think these are quite manageable problems, and I think Japan <clears throat> is pretty good at managing them. Very good. Okay, just a swift follow-up on, on one aspect of that, because, um, you know, as long as I've been going to Japan on and off for, for quite a few years now, I would very often get a lecture from Japanese officials about what a disaster the debt was yeah. and how it was going to eat everything, and, you know, all that was going to happen was that at some point interest rates would rise yep. and the whole government budget would be consumed by debt service. Are you saying they were worrying about nothing, that, that it was just a... <laughs> I think they're probably problem? worried. I, I think it gets to a point in economics where if it had gone on for three years, you couldn't be sure it would last, or 10 years. This has been going on for 28 years, right? This Japanese model of large public deficits and large BOJ purchases of government debt has been going on for the better part of, of three decades. Uh, and I think it may be a, a sustainable equilibrium. Now, look. You, you, you have to have a point of view about reaching some sort of balance in the public sector at, at some stage. But I wouldn't hurry it. Um, I, I would think carefully about whether definitely to go ahead uh, with the sales tax increase this April. Of course, it was a bit of a problem last time it was done in April 2015. And certainly, I think if it does go ahead, we'll see all sorts of offsetting public expenditures. So I think there has been an ideology, and I meet it exactly when I go to Japan, that this, this debt is a disaster, we've got to pay it back. But it, if you've got a central bank which is willing to buy a significant proportion of the debt issue, then a deficit can be sustainable over a long period of time. And indeed, as long as the corporate and personal sectors of the Japanese economy 
have savings rates significantly in excess of their investment rates. You could argue in macroeconomics, and certainly if your colleague Martin Wolf were here, uh, he would argue it, that you need the government to run a deficit in order to offset the structural surplus of the corporate and the personal sector. So if I were the MOF, I'd worry about it much less than they do. Mm. Though I notice every time I have a meeting with them, they tell me they're very worried about it. They tell me they're going to fix it in the next two years. And when I go back two years later, somehow <laughs> they haven't got, quite got around to fixing it. <laughs> OK. So, so Japan shouldn't be worrying about this debt thing that we've been told they should be worrying about, the internal problem. Well, maybe we can substitute an external worry, which is the international trading environment. Yeah. We've got uh, the most protectionist president of the United States we've had you know, ever, <laughs> I think. Uh, we have a trade war starting between the US and China. And within that, Japan, which used to be portrayed as this protectionist country, has now emerged as a champion of free trade, as you pointed <laughs> out, minister, signing uh, all sorts of trade agreements. Um, but how worried are you by that international environment? Do you see, you know, Japan's a great trading nation, that the, the, the situation is getting worse and potentially is dangerous to your companies and to your economy? What's your view? Well, the situation hadn't gone into that serious state yet because if you look at the fundamentals of Japanese economy, they are being stable. Still, that's my view. However, between United States and China, what is called a trade war, coming up with additional tariffs for tit for tat, will not give a positive impact on Japanese economy for sure. Look at the Japanese businesses. They operate in U.S., making local production there. And uh, parts uh, purchasing costs uh, could rise as a result of those eventuality. And also look at uh, China. There are companies operating in China as well. But they may find it difficult to sell their products to the United States. That's another negative point. So between US and uh, China, two economic power uh, having a tit for tat for uh, imposing uh, uh, tariffs in addition, which is not a good thing. Well, I'm, I'm sure the others would like to talk about the trading environment, but Tank, I'd like to ask you something quite specific, because uh, you said that uh, you're wondering the corridors of Davos. People keep asking you, Nissan, Carlos Ghosn, what's going on? Uh, <laughs> to me? <laughs> so uh, you know, Davos has got a, I don't know whether, I'd say a bad habit of avoiding the controversial issues. So if you're prepared to actually talk about something controversial, great, go for it. I'm not aware of the details of, of, <laughs> behind the case. I'm supposed to know, but uh, or I'm supposed to know, I know. But <laughs> from the uh, what I learned from media, well, definitely, uh, it's not uh, uh, denied that there was uh, uh, misconduct or breach of trust, definitely. And uh, I understand uh, uh, there is uh, uh, argument from uh, other countries about uh, I mean, the challenge to the Japanese judicial system. But have you said that? I just want to touch upon the corporate governance because please, please. Uh, Minister Seiko mentioned about the corporate governance. I think the real issue of Nissan case is uh, corporate governance, which didn't function well. Why were <clears throat> government authorities got involved? Because if the corporate governance uh, had worked well. I think uh, something to revamp that the situation should have happened. So I just want to, 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 to raise the issue. Um, this is the uh, warning to the, uh, maybe the effectiveness of, of corporate governance. Probably it's not only the, uh, Nissan is not only the case. I don't know, probably. There's a possibility that uh, we may see more cases. Because I'm, I've been CEO for 20 years. I don't like to be challenged, I'm sure. And if uh, there is no independent uh, uh, board of directors who have the uh, sense of integrity and have the great uh, uh, say to CEO, I think uh, that should be uh, 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 the, the, the ideal case. So we have to review effectiveness of the corporate governance. Though, 
we've been in, uh, improving corporate governance. And as, as the uh, corporate governance code, which uh, requests uh, at least two independent board directors, that's a great move. But now is the time we've got to see the effectiveness of the corporate governance. I think uh, uh, that's uh, what I want to say. And uh, in personal view, more than one out of the two in, uh, 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 independent uh, board of directors should be incumbent the CEO or chairman. Because the, uh, somebody from the board should understand the mindset of the CEO, not to run rough, probably. Check and balance. Could be good friends, fine. But uh, somebody in the, in the board should understand the business per se and, and immediate what's happening and what kind of his or her mindset. I think that's uh, we have to, we might have to think about. And the second thing, nomination. And uh, 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 remuneration committees should be in place without fail. And uh, I believe Nissan didn't have such you know, nomination and uh, uh, compensation committees. And that should be run by independent board of directors. I think uh, we have to see a review for the further effectiveness of the Jap Japan's corporate governance. And plus, stewardship code should be strengthened for the sake of the, uh, the big voice from institutional investors. So we've been improving a lot, but uh, now is the time to, to stop and think. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Minister, do you want to say something? Uh, no, well, as mentioned by Mr. Ninami, when it comes to Nissan issue, it is a relevant issue for the corporate governance, particularly in the global alliance, uh, what kind of corporate governance should be. Uh, that is the uh, problem being uh, opposed, which is making the situation more complex. Let me talk about the judicial system of Japan. It may not be politically correct for many ministers to say something about that, but uh, let me say it as one Japanese individual. We do have uh, a strictly rule of law country, all the criminal no procedures are stipulated by the law, and uh, it is equal to everyone. No difference between foreigner or non-foreigner, or the wealthy person or non-wealthy person, or if it is an economic offense or the uh, criminal offense. All this uh, criminal and the judicial system is applied equally, both uh, foreign and uh, domestic individual. That's one thing I like to say. And the second, I would like to say that each country do have their own judicial system based on their own history. And if you just highlight one aspect of it and say that uh, this particular system is right or not, it's uh, not a fair argument. Just for example, in Japan, if you like to uh, arrest someone, then the prosecutor uh, have to get uh, uh, ap approval from the independent uh, court. And uh, in France, uh, they have a uh, different system of a uh, judge for pre-trial. And uh, at their own decision, uh, they can arrest someone. But uh, in Japan, when it comes to economic uh, offense, uh, you may not be allowed to have a uh, tapping of the communication except for very uh, grave uh, crime offense. But in Europe and the United States, for every crime, it's OK to tap the communication. So uh, in this way, each country has a different history behind their own judicial system. So it's not fair to just highlight one aspect or put a spotlight on one aspect and have a discussion. Can I follow up? Yeah, quickly. Um, I agree with you. However, um, we have to understand, we Japan have to understand the international sensitivity. We have to speak up about what's happening. Because yeah. I've got so many questions about the judicial system. And a lot of people say, what, what's, what the hell is going on? Mm. So I can talk to the friends here, but what about uh, you know, other people in the world? Because uh, we are surrounded by international context, so the government or this agent has to talk yeah. about that to the to the the, the, the public. Yeah, I and mean, Kaika, that that sort of leads on to. I mean, I think what what uh, Tak is implying is that some foreigners who are involved in business in Japan are beginning to think, "Hang on, you know, am I involved in a country where something quite bad could happen to me that I had no idea was going to happen?" Now you're involved in the international mm -hmm. 
side of your business. Mm. So just on broad terms, how good a fit do you think Japanese corporate culture and traditions are with the international businesses that you have to work with? Are there frequent misunderstandings, differences of corporate culture? So um, there are differences in corporate culture like any other two countries. I, I think it's not just a unique Japanese um, uh, way of doing business. I think one thing that we probably do have a disadvantage is that the lack of diversity within the country. Um, because uh, if you go to the U.S., I worked in Singapore, in, in London, and in New York, in my, in my offices, you have a mix of people. Not, if you go to the U.S., it's not just U.S., there's Canadians or people from Europe within that office. But if you go to a, a Japanese company, the majority of people in that office would be Japanese. Mm. So that sort of exasperates the problem of cultural understanding. Mm. And I think we need to work on that so we could, we, because it's not good for companies like ours. We, we, we work with, um, we have offices outside, we work with um, other countries. So I think we really need to work on it. And it's, not, it's something, as, as the, the woman problem that we mentioned before, it's something that we really need to work on. Yeah, I mean, Adair Turner, one of the previous jobs that you had I didn't mention was you were head of the Confederation of British Industry, Japanese industry, a big presence in Britain. Generally, um, how did you, you feel that worked? I mean, did, did they meld in pretty, pretty well? I mean, they remain crucial to British industry, yeah? Yeah, I thought you were about to ask me about Brexit, and I was going to no. leave... <laughs> I was going to... I was going to leave the room at that point. Uh, you know, I've come all the way. I was going to hold you down. I've, I've got to come to Davos to escape. Right? I think we're, we're, we're both hoping well, for no, a Brexit. Look, I, 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 I think you know Japanese industry has played a very major role um, within um, the UK and, and it is deeply embedded and is crucial to some of our sectors. I mean, in particular, the automotive sector with Toyota and, and, and Nissan. Uh, many of the consumer electronic sectors. They're major players in that. They've been that, you know, for for thirty or forty years. Um, and, you know, I think it is a completely, it's a completely frictionless relationship. It's something we, we almost don't think about because it, it, it works perfectly well. I mean, it, it's, it's just not something that uh, 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 concerns us in any way. It's, a, it's an entirely uh, positive uh, development. Could I say something on the, on, on the, uh, the, the trade war Please stuff? Do, yeah. I, I don't know whether you wanted to come back to that. Yeah, do. Yeah. It, it does strike to me that it would be amazing if Japan does not have uh, an economic problem coming from the trade war this year simply because China is going to have an economic problem. And, you know, China has been attempting to go through an incredibly difficult uh, internal rebalancing away from investment to consumption, uh, controlling the excessive growth of bank debt and shadow banking debt. And right in the middle of what was a very difficult thing to manage, I think they were managing it well, but it was still inherently difficult, they have been hit by the trade war. Uh, initially, we were surprised by the Chinese export and import figures up to about October, November, but I think that may well have been people getting in orders ahead of the tariff increases. The latest figures on Chinese exports and imports are, are quite dramatic. They're quite a dramatic hit. Um, there is a significant slowdown in the, the Chinese economy uh, go, go going on, and it is impossible for Japan to be separate from that for two reasons. Mm. First, mm. it's in that mm. region, that mm. integrated yeah, set of supply chains that links uh, China, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and secondly, it sells to uh, China, it sells premium goods, it sells luxury goods, and it sells capital goods. It sells yeah. factory automation equipment and things like that. We've already seen, I think, an inevitable consequence of the Chinese slowdown in the latest figures from Germany, which also has exactly the same profile of its exports to China. And I would be amazed if we don't see a, a, a significant uh, effect there, which I am sure means that Prime Minister Abe is doing his very best uh, for to persuade President Trump to approach the world in a rational fashion, but he may have as little success on that as everybody else. Right. Well, um, before I uh, turn to the audience, I'd like to do that next. But, Minister, I'd just like to ask you one specific question, picking up from what Adair just said, about the relationship with China. Uh, because, again, I, I, talking of Nissan, I remember visiting Nissan just after the whole Senkaku Islands dispute had flared up. They were the subject of a consumer boycott in, in China. I think their sales had dropped 80%. And there was a lot of talk then that maybe Japan should try to, if not exactly de-link from China, become less dependent on China. 
<coughs> six years on since since that. I mean, wh where does is China actually inevitably going to be central to the Japanese economy because just because of its size in the global economy and it's the the region you're in, or have you diversified? Well, first of all, in terms of the market, if you look at China, they have a 1.4 billion people worth of uh, market. So it's pretty important. The importance remains to be the same. But uh, as a destination of uh, investment, of course, in the past, uh, due to the political relationship and so forth, uh, Japanese uh, businesses uh, have made uh, diversified investment. It's not only due to the political issue, but uh, labor cost has been going up in China. That's one more reason. So already Japanese businesses are quite diversified in terms of choosing the destination for their investment. And the uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, looking at the economic relationship between Japan and China and uh, looking to uh, elevated to new heights and dimension. And so that uh, in the third market, uh, as agreed upon by President Xi and the Prime Minister Abe, uh, Japan and China can work together. It's not uh, either of the two. Uh, we can work together in the third country market. We used to be a competitor, but uh, we do have a strength mutually. So we can take advantage of each country's strength and try to combine them in the third country market. Then uh, we can create a new model. So I am in charge of this. Just for example, in Thailand, there is a EEC, the industrial estate. Uh, where uh, Japan and China are working together to develop the industrial park. Uh, the back and forth relation between China and the U.S. Uh, will never create any solutions at all. But uh, think about the current Japanese position, which is very unique, because uh, the relation with China has been the best probably in our history. I, I feel so. And a lot of inbound visitors from China. Yeah. A lot, of tourists. A lot. tourists. Yes, and the per ticket is is okay. Yep. Yep. It's a coming slipping off a little bit. Yep. And plus, uh, we have a good relation with the United States. We might have the uh, bridging function. Well, you know, it's yes. ideal. That's right. But uh, somebody has to do it. Uh, who is doing uh, like uh, waving a uh, you know, uh, you know bearer of I mean uh, uh, free trade bearer. So somebody has to do it. Don't give up, knowing that uh, the tech war will not end. But uh, we can talk about uh, IP protection, the so second layer, not the you know, data transfer. And uh, <coughs> I think our government may have the great I mean, a role to uh, minimize the, 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 the risk to, to all the uh, further tensions between the two countries. So I think a unique position should be leveraged by, I think, now. OK. Um, I'd like to give the audience uh, a chance to ask some questions. Yeah, uh, gentlemen in the front row, I think you might get a microphone. Um, if you could say who you are, uh, yeah, that would be great. My name is Yoshi Hori of Globus Japan. I have a question to Minister Seko. Well, uh, in this Davos, we have seen two major discussions going on. One is about climate change, and, and one is about social divides, as far as I'm concerned. Social divides can be seen from U the US Trump, UK Brexit and France Yellow Vest movement. And if you think about Japan, it's the only country in G7 which is societal stability and political stability. I wonder why we don't see any populist movement going on. We don't see any kind of far right, you know, uh, politics going on. We don't see major social divides. And uh, and the, can, the question is why do we don't have that kind of uh, issues? And the second question is, can we continue to yeah. have that kind of uh, social stability? Moving forward. You asked me a very difficult question. Well, first of all, to start with, of course, there are data pertaining to disparity and uh, imbalance. But uh, in general, Japanese people didn't feel much disparity. And for the past six year period, the Abenomics has been in motion, which had uh, raised the income per capita. That's uh, one of the big elements, but uh, would it continue way into the future? The innovation can bring about a uh, further divide those who are innovation savvy and who are not. So I'm not talking about the income disparity. It's a disparity of hope. So this is precisely the area which you need to be covered through education. It's not 
merely the grade school or the secondary school and the colleges, but the recurrent education will be very important in time of our fourth industrial revolution era. Every individual has to take part so that they can flourish, and the education has to back up that. That is where we can also start. And also, one more point I'd like to say. The manufacturing would continue to be very important, in my view. In the United States, there are dissatisfied people uh, who are mainly working for the manufacturing sector. Look at IT and software who can do codes and uh, good ideas. They are high-income earners, but uh, people who engage in manufacturing were not that so high-income earner. But I would say that uh, in the end, for the fourth Industrial Revolution, robot uh, is the typical area where the uh, things would uh, tend to be reaching. So it's very important that uh, we have to have a mechanism in the market where good income could also be produced from the manufacturing sector as well. That's why I propose the concept of connected industries from the manufacturing sector. Much data are being produced, and manufacturer can take advantage of us so that they can go more advanced and raise the productivity and raise the value added so that those people who are working for the manufacturing sector can also benefit in terms of getting higher income from the fourth industrial revolution. That is what I'm thinking. Something? I know that. Yeah, please, Kaka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think the major issue is because Japan doesn't have an immigration problem. Yeah. It is. I think that's that's that's. Yeah, the, let's be true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think that's. The, I think it's very difficult for the government to a answer that in that way because that's. Yep. Yep. But I think that's. Yep. Well yeah. Said. And uh, yeah, and yet Japan now feels the need to, to open up to immigration. And yeah. I think that's why they're very careful how they want to proceed yep. with it. But but it's it's yep. inevitable that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the woman over here. Uh, the do we have a microphone for her. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, well, perhaps you pass it along and then we'll get it back to you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Leila and I'm a global shaper from China. Um, so last year, I actually have the privilege to become an a independent board of director for one of the Japanese technology uh, listed company. Uh, so first, I would like to say thank you, uh, Prime Min uh, Minister, <laughs> uh, for yet. your beautiful country. <laughs> For your beautiful country to accept me, um, a foreigner. Um, but when I talk to my Japanese friend, like the same um, 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 young age people, they always tell me that it's very challenging for them to establish their own business in Japan. Um, they feel the the society is still belong to pretty much all the gentlemen here. Uh, probably not not much luck for the for the young generation. So my question. Um, to the minister um, is uh, what is the Japanese um, government's plan and policy to encourage the young generation to be part of the innovation and to be part of the Japanese um, economic growth? Thank you. Yeah, good question. I might get the private sector people as also to comment in a second. But minister, you first. The question is for you. Ano. Well, thank you for the question. Is it true that I look at the younger generation of uh, Japan? And uh, it's uh, true that uh, we don't have uh, many young startups. If you look at the opening ratio of uh, companies and startup ratio by international standard, it's very low. And also venture capital, which funds those kind of uh, efforts, is very low compared particularly uh, with the uh, United States and uh, way low compared with China even. And that situation continues. So I would really like to encourage uh, the uh, young ones, uh, startups, and the government support is needed. For the past 20 year period, major measures have been taken by government to, to encourage the venture, but uh, it has not been effective. So ever since last year, we came up with a J Startup project. Uh, we copied French tech. The um, French tech is something we had copied. So among these startups, there are some who can be competitive globally. So very promising uh, J uh, startup have been chosen, 92, and concentrated support will be given to them in a focused fashion. We've been doing that. And a uh, uh, role model for the young people, the venture uh, businesses can be nurtured. So uh, J startup uh, is something that we are working on very seriously. That is our first step.
any sense of uh, whether Japan can become a startup nation, Keiko? So I think that the, the, it's a cultural thing that it's difficult to accept failure. So a lot of the startups in the US is you fail one or twice and then you have a successful entity. In Japan, if you fail once, it's difficult to go, go the second time around. So you don't have a chance to learn from your mistakes. And I think if that changes, then there are lots of young people that would like to start making mistakes. Tack, you want to say something? Yes, I, I'm, I'm, well, I partially agree, but well, still the, the, I mean, the cost of a failure in Japan is still more than the, the, the US, but it has been changing a lot. For example, when I joined Mitsubishi Corp, that's my first career, 200 classmates. And we, I had the, the uh, classmate gathering, 150 still working, hmm. okay? But now, a lot of people are leaving big corporations, joining venture capital ventures, I think there are so many opportunities now, and the fund is available. So you, if you want to do something new, I think <coughs> we can get credit. I mean, a fund raising. So environment has changed. But however, we should not rely on the government policy too much. We private sectors have to play a key role, such as trade sale to bring some businesses, small business to big corporations like Suntory. I think that's a healthy way. Right. So I think uh, the government created a path for the younger generation to mm. join the small businesses. But uh, big corporations have to do more things. Okay, the gentleman there with the microphone. Coming of uh, uh, Bulgarian Cardiac Institute. In my group, we have a program to reallocate uh, Japanese pensioners to Bulgaria. It's called Samurai Bulgaria. And yeah. basically, we, I'm, I'm very curious to learn the, the, the opinion of both of you, the, the bad students and the good students, as if this is the division. Uh, how much relief would that reallocation of Japanese pensioners? As you maybe know, mm. the most expensive years in life are the last years <laughs> of life. So this is our specialty. Uh, so the question is, uh, how much relief uh, such thing would bring to Japanese social security system, maybe unleashing the entrepreneurship, what you... This is the you mean literally kind of get Jap old Japanese people to come and live in Bulgaria? Oh Bulgari? yes, we, we built several, several small villages now as experiment. They're very much How's interested. It going? Well, Bulgarian, Bulgarian uh, yogurt is very popular in Japan. Everybody can participate. <laughs> <laughs> We're famous, famous with our uh, uh, healthy lifestyles. And on top of this, we have the top of uh, the cream of, uh, in healthcare anyway. Now, with the, so therefore, I mean, this is the ideal situation. And now the foreign minister encouraged me to contact your pension funds because logically, who on the business side would be interested is the pension funds to get longer time the installments. Okay, well, so, anybody fancy ending their life in Bulgaria? Uh, how, how's the sushi? <laughs> <laughs> You've got really good sushi. Let's, okay, let's, okay. Let's, let's um, okay, okay. <laughs> well, that's a, a tough one. I don't know what anybody's got anything particular to say about it, but it's a, certainly an interesting <laughs> modern development. Um, <laughs> Uh, can I respond to your question? On an individual basis, uh, they may go to the Bulgaria to uh, spend a retirement life. Of course, we can welcome that. But uh, as uh, far as the government is concerned, sending the pensioners over to abroad is something government is not thinking. Because uh, uh, look at the pensioners. They almost hold all of the savings in Japan. So we have to encourage them to spend the money within Japan. And that's a top priority issue for the ministers working for Japanese government. So if pensioners go out of by Japan and spend, and it may not be good news for Japan. Uh, any further questions from the floor? Yeah, the woman in the front row. My name is Lena. I'm from Singapore. But currently, I'm working in Thailand, the largest industrial city. Uh, and we have uh, benefited from the Minister uh, Meti, which is Minister Seiko team, with regards to the third, part, third country collaboration between China and Japan. Uh, I think your team is really doing a good job because over the differences in culture between China and Japan. Uh, but my question is basically looking at the uh, Tokyo Olympics 2020 and also looking into the figures with regards to the aging population. The education system in, in Japan or the schools in Japan are, are actually getting lesser students. Uh, and I'm also one of the students that have studied you know, Kaizen before. What are the opportunities for Japanese educational system, the providers, to be export overseas, so that in the countries of ASEAN, we can all benefit from the good quality Japanese education. Mm. Wow. Mm. 
あのそれはですね基本 Yeah, let me touch upon that. Basically, Japanese education system、uh, can be recognized、uh, as being doing well. Then, if that country can be a receiver of a Japanese education system, already in the Middle East,、uh, certain things have been done. In the Middle Eastern region, ever since the childhood, Some of the countries would like to introduce Japanese、uh, style of、uh, education. There are some of them found in the、uh, Middle East region, so that、uh, primary school、uh, know how is being transferred from Japan. And if you go to the old enough to become a high school student and、uh, more older, Of course,、uh, manufacturing、uh, expertise of、uh, Japan can be transferred, and there are much requests coming from Southeast Asia on that、uh, score as well. So it's not only a matter of、uh, schooling education, but、uh, education done in the corporate sector as well. Coming towards the end,、uh, any, any further questions from the floor? Okay, well, that's probably just as well, because we've got about a couple of minutes left. So I'd like to end by asking you all to, to look forward to this year where Japan is. Is holding the, the G20,、um, at, as I said at the beginning, a very sensitive time. What do you think Japan can realistically expect to achieve? What should it expect to achieve? Perhaps, Adair, I'll start with you. Well, what do I like it to achieve?、Uh, I would like Japan to be playing more of a leadership role in climate change、uh, than it is, because this happens to be my major area of focus at the moment climate change and energy. And right at the moment, I see Japan. I have, as is clear, you would have seen a great admiration for Japan, but I'm worried about Japan's approach to climate change at、mm. the moment. I think it is an odd mix of some great areas of technological advance, particularly in relation to hydrogen economy, particularly in batteries, major leader of batteries. But I have one major problem with the Japanese approach、uh, to、uh, climate change, which is that Japan believes that there is a thing called clean coal, and there fundamentally isn't a thing. Called clean coal.、Uh, there's slightly less dirty coal.、Uh, there's coal that you can burn in a power station、uh, if you do it really, really well at 600 grams per kilowatt hour rather than really bad coal at 1300 kilowatt grams per kilowatt hour. But there is no clean coal. And as long as the world goes on burning thermal coal,、um, then we have absolutely no hope whatsoever of meeting the Paris climate agreements. So I would like to see. Japan, particularly in the area where it has this fantastic technological capability of forgetting about the chimera of clean coal and concentrating on the things which are undoubtedly good、uh, for society, which is the batteries, the hydrogen, the solar, and the other technologies、mm. in which you could play a very big leadership role.、Mm. Okay. Okay, so it's partly related to what you said, but Japan is.、Um, The government is, and a lot of corporates are, are, are invested in so, the social development goals of the United Nations. And I think as a country,、um, a lot of education is going on to the people. And I think we, we could have a model of how a country could,、uh, uh, could encompass the SDG goals、mm. and、uh, make it something that could sort of extend to the world. I'd like to touch upon the free trade.、Mm-hmm. I think.、Uh, I like Prime Minister because、uh, he was always persistent and consistent about the CPTPP. And、uh, the situation in the United States has been changing because the robusty, I mean, the economic robusty has been a bit slipping down. I mean, forecast is kind of weak <coughs> for the year to 2020. And the negotiation leverage of the Trump administration <coughs> was the, its great economy, but、uh, won't, won't last forever. So, probably we can talk to the United States to rejoin the TPP.、Mm-hmm. Nobody knows. And the dream big and make it happen with the real reality. But I think、uh, we should increase the number of、uh, countries to join CPTPP. And we should be consistent and、uh, persistent about re- letting the United States rejoin TPP. I think. The value of Japan is always consistent and persistent. So don't give it up. Well, you didn't. I mean, a lot of people said TPP was dead when the Americans pulled out, and, and in fact, it kept. No, but the situation is a lot better, and the、yeah. likelihood is、uh, you know, bigger than the last year. Right. Minister,、uh, you'll, you'll be taking an active part in the G20. I'm sure you think about it a lot.、Uh, the prime, prime Minister set out some of the goals.、Um, what particularly will you be looking forward to? うん、あの2つのことを思います。
Well, there are two things I would like to mention here. Firstly, more than anything else, the rules for the digital trade need to be set. Uh, to that end, uh, G20 will be a very important forum. And also, as mentioned by Mr. Turner, I could answer his question that uh, through G20, we can also address the innovation issue in terms of environment. We can take a little on that. Beginning from uh, April, with the uh, next fiscal year as a budget, the R&D diffusion-related budget for hydrogen have been increased uh, significantly. And also, for the CO2, uh, there is a limit to reducing the CO2. So CO2 needs to be captured and stored and used. So we like to take a lead in this area, too. I can speak one hour with Mr. Turner about the goodness about clean coal, but clean coal plus carbon capture is a combination that we would like to appeal. This is going to be our next catchphrase. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let the two of you, as they say in Britain, sort it out outside afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I, it's clearly, I mean, as, as Prime Minister Abe said, and it's been interesting, I think one of the, the questioners said, climate change has been, I think, more than ever a big subject at this year's Davos. It's clearly going to be a big subject throughout the G20. So uh, thank you all to the panel. I'd just like to thank you for a very lively discussion. Thank the audience for excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you.